In the 1960s, there was a very, very severe fire up in the hills here, and it burned about 400 acres. It's the vast majority of the existing nature preserve was burned right to the ground. And uh, needless to say, it completely reset the clock as far as ecological succession goes. 62 was one of them. That was a three day. Uh, we had to have 10 companies in because we couldn't fight fire for three days. We had to sleep. Uh, we had some injuries. Uh, normally in a brush fire, we don't have injuries. But this one we did. So yeah, there was a fire here back in 62 um, that burned somewhat of 400 acres or so. We weren't here back then. Um, we learned about it once we moved here in 1969. And what we saw when we moved here was a, you know, a forest, or not really a forest, but it was mainly had, it had grown up somewhat. So there were a lot of uh, small saplings, pretty low growth, a lot of uh, dead tree snags. You could see the charring on the trunks and stuff. Um, so that's what we saw that was kind of the evidence of the fire and the natural succession that was starting to take place. Trees were smoldering. Uh, those, if we see them smoldering, they're giving off embers or sparks or brands as they're called. We have to cut them down, put them out. Uh, so that's what a lot of us do after the fire. Uh, the ground is, is all black. The, the number of species that we saw here and the, when you add them all up was largely a product of the fire because it brought the forest back to a regrowing forest. Today I continue to be interested in bird conservation because I think there are a lot of threats today to um, birds, wildlife, and nature in general. So today I'm a member of the, uh, I'm on the board of directors for the Connecticut Ornithological Association. I'm also on the board of directors for uh, the regional board for Connecticut Audubon Society up in Glastonbury. Um, and I also really believe in the importance of, of gathering data to, to really be able to document what changes are happening. So Clark Pond behind us here, um, you can see it's a very, uh, it's a very shallow pond that uh, has a lot of emergent vegetation. Um, it's a place that I would approach, not from this end, but I would go through the woods and toward the far end of the pond and um, in the stream. It, yeah, but it would it has wood ducks, um, ring neck ducks, osprey, use it for fishing, um, great blue herons. Um, so it attracts a whole different population of birds that like like the water. I think the headwaters of Clark Pond are a, rev a ravine, which is the deepest part part of Azaragacha Hill. There are several ravines because this has all been glaciated before, left ridge rocks that you can see the glacial marks. Later on trees grew up, mainly deciduous trees, and became mature. And then at the fire those trees were burned down. Except I think a lot of them were preserved in the ravine that we did as our study. I don't think they burned down as much because they were down in there, in a lower place, and were protected to some extent, I believe. During, during the fire in the 1960s, a lot of these trees up in, in the, the hills themselves did actually get burned on, down to the ground. But as you can well imagine, in the, in the lower ravines, first of all, because they have so much water that they're, they can count on, they, they're moisture trees to begin with. They're, they're a little bit more protected from the fire just in that way. Plus it's also more isolated from the wind and so the, so the trees tend to grow a little better and a little faster. Ours, we had 25 mile an hour winds and we were chasing it. You don't step in front of a fire like that. I've been a firefighter or a volunteer firefighter for a couple of years, yeah. 64. You know, there's a lot of things we use for uh, in the uh, brush fires. Portable pumps, forestry hose, Indian tanks, booster hoses, anything we can get our hands on to fight the fire. Uh, shovels, all right, rakes. We had axes, chainsaws, and this is what we used to fight the fire. Besides hose, we, we had forestry hose during brush fires. 
And it's a funny thing, the brush, the uh, hose weeps that's so it doesn't burn as you bring it through the fire. <laughs> well, you carried it on your back and you laid it just like a, an engine would. Following a large fire like we had in 1960 here, essentially all of the nutrients that were being held up in the trees have, have fallen to the ground in the, in the form of ash. And it's a very rich soil. It, it creates a very rich soil for all of the small seedlings to, to grow up. And so you end up with a lot of very small bushes. Grasses can grow. And of course, as you, as you know, deer and that kind of thing can, uh, can harvest the grasses. So there's grasses, small bushes, that kind of thing. And then eventually you get tree seedlings. They don't shade the, uh, the ground that much. But eventually they start getting to the point where they're as mature as these trees. And then they're starting to uh, uh, change the ecosystem. I didn't actively bird until I came to Connecticut, moved into the house we're presently in, adjacent in Osbergachie Hill, 50 years ago in 1969. That's when we moved here. So this happened to be in our backyard. So it was very advantageous to the start of it. Yeah, so back in the, uh, I guess, 70s and 80s when we were pretty active here, um, there were a number of species back then that really aren't found at all today in this area or in the Oswegatchie Hills. So um, that's a probably a caused by a number of factors. Um, certainly, natural succession is a big plays a big role in changing the mix of species that that utilize an area. Succession is just a natural progression of different types of vegetation that ultimately end up in what's called a climax vegetation. Each area has its own natural climax vegetation and it depends on things like rainfall, sunlight, duration of sunlight, uh, growing season, and soil quality. In this particular part of the country, we have enough rainfall, and sunlight and duration of sunlight so that our natural climax vegetation is very large mature trees with a very heavy what's called a canopy which blocks sunlight from coming in and blocks what's called the understory in other words smaller vegetation from growing very well. In this particular case where we are right now is not a climax vegetation, but it's, in, it's a maturing forest. It's in the process of ultimately reaching climax vegetation. So what we have here is we have enough sunlight filtering through to allow some vegetation to grow on the ground. For example, this area here is typical of what we find here in the hills. It's a, a little blueberry patch. It's, it's wild blueberries. They don't grow big like the ones that we cultivate, but they feed the birds and the animals, and some hikers when they get hungry enough. So back when this forest was in the early regrowth stage, um, there were a lot of birds like um, blue-winged warblers, prairie warblers, um, whippoorwill, um, some of the species that, that, use, that really rely on shrubland habitat um, were really common here. Um, and gradually over time, um, these species started to, to fall away. Um, because they depend on these early successional habitats. Rough grouse would be one of those. We had a lot of rough grouse and they like more scrubland. Well, in a climax forest, there's, there's still gonna be some animal life, but it's gonna be restricted to certain species. For example, a lot of the trees that grow in a climax vegetation, such as uh, maple trees, oak trees, hickories, beech trees, they all have 
they all have their own uh, fruiting nuts and the nuts provide a lot of uh, food for squirrels, chipmunks and the like, but it doesn't feed a lot of species of birds, for instance. Bird watching and bird uh, study is a lot of identification, looking at small details in birds. As Roger Torrey Peterson, who lived in Old Lyman, wrote many birding guides and was a bird artist, said, uh, he, he identified birds by a process known as field marks. So in his bird guides, he points arrows to certain points that one should look for, certain details. So that appealed to me as a science background and microbiologist. So that hooked me a little bit too in one of the reasons for my interest. Plus I'm musically inclined to some extent and bird song interested me musically. So those two things fit right in with what I was interested in. So when you're starting out, of course, you usually have a field guide and you, you know, you look at the field guide, you look for different field marks and you try to match that to the bird you see. <laughs> but as you, yeah, you use a, one of these. Um, but as you gain experience, um, it becomes much more of an automatic process in terms of identifying birds. So you look at, you listen for sound, you look at the plumage details, you look at the behavior, uh, flight pattern, um, the silhouette, um, where is the bird, what habitat. Um, there's a whole set of clues that you combine together that tell you that, you know, if I'm looking up here and I see a bird soaring in the air, it's got a dihedral wing um, shape, it's probably going to be a turkey vulture. So when I was growing up here, um, spending all the time out in the Oswegatchie Hills, I was also taking a lot of notes of what I saw, so trying to keep a record of, of what was here. And so I used different little, uh, different notebooks and, and, and took notes. Um, I compiled some of these notes together into kind of a master list of, you know, the birds of Oswegatchie Hills, where I list all the species here. Um, so this, in 1978, according to my records at least, we had recorded 162 species in the Oswegatchie Hills. Um, that number has gone up since then. Um, I have another more uh, recent list of birds in the hills that's up to about 178 species from the time that we were here. So um, that gives you an idea. So we, we, back then it was all pencil and paper, you know, that was the way, you know, I'd go out and I'd come home and usually, uh, you know, write down a list. Here's a, so this is May 13th, 1974. Um, so I was, what, 11 years old at that, well, actually 10 years old. Um, so what I wrote down here is flicker nest in dead tree next door, chickadee nest in tree, blue winged warbler, May 14th, Baltimore Oriole, and about eight exclamation points after <laughs> it. I must have been pretty excited. Cool. Um, Flicker nest where path crosses brook. Possible woodpecker nest. Prairie warbler. Ruffed grouse nest near hemlocks. Uh, four exclamation points for that one. Now there's no hemlocks. But, yeah. Um, bird nest with eggs. So, I mean, this is very early on, obviously. And as I grew older, the notes got more detailed and more, probably more accurate, too. So today, um, Cornell University developed this uh, online database database called eBird um, and it's really a, an amazing uh, resource as well as repository for bird data. So today when bird watchers go out, many of them at least, um, will uh, record the species and numbers of birds that they've seen in this in an online app on your iPhone you can do it or you can do it at home on your computer. Um, and when you go out, you would uh, either as you go or after the fact, put in the, the species that you've seen. And so Cornell or eBird aggregates all, all of these lists in one place. And what that does for you is you can actually then query the data and combines all these lists. And you can, for instance, here's a, you know, a, a bar chart for the Oswegatchie Hills based on the lists that were um, put into the eBird system and it tells you throughout the year when certain species are are seen 
um, based on those lists again. Um, so you can actually see that in the winter you're not going to see certain species because they're only here during the summer. And the eBird, um, for instance, shows that yellow-billed cuckoos are only found or have only been recorded in May, June, July time frame. So the Oswegatchie Hills, um, one other interesting thing to mention about the hills is that they're on a migratory pathway for birds. Um, not only um, land birds, warblers and thrushes and things like that, but also it's a nice uh, pathway for migratory hawks to go through. And uh, so when I was a teenager, I would go on the roof of my parents' house, look out toward the hills, um, and the hills create an updraft for hawks to follow um, to help them go on their way. And so I would uh, do a hawk watch. I did this for a number of years actually. And you know, some days I'd have upwards of uh, 500 different hawks, you know, coming through. Um, and again, I did that just by hopping on the roof and staying out there for the afternoon and uh, counting the hawks. So that's, that's another way to measure bird populations is to watch what passes by. And this is the time of year for that right now, in late September and early October. That's just, you're flying now. The value of protecting nature for me, and I think human beings generally, is that we're evolved from humans that evolved to deal in, live in savannas and nature generally because they needed nature to survive. So we are closely attached to nature, and I believe that people find peace, solitude, and renewal when they visit nature or are surrounded by nature. And I think it's a human need, myself. And I know I need it. And this has been very handy, very useful to me as a place, this Oswegatchie Hill Preserve, because it preserves that space in practically my backyard. So I believe because of the way we evolved, we still retain an attachment to nature. The only advice I have to the people that are watching this video is come on out and see for yourself. It's, it's just a tremendous place. Um, if, if you want to have a guided tour, just contact the Friends of the Azogachi Hills Nature Preserve and, and we'll provide that tour. And it was a warm day, so I marched up the hill, and when I got to the top, I was overheated. I hadn't had breakfast, and I just went down, and they had to carry me down. But I got back into the play. 